Thank you, Brian. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I, I'm aware of the honor I have of addressing such an august audience. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizers, Brian and the others, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I hope that at the end of the talk, you will not feel that they are responsible for the choice, that it was a mistake, but that it, we make mistakes in order to learn. <clears throat> I will tell you that although I am often invited to speak, I'm rarely invited back. Um, and that's because I have a tendency to tell the truth, which an old Turkish proverb says, if you're going to do that, you should always have one foot in a stirrup. Um, let me begin uh, by acknowledging that uh, what we're doing today is beginning a conversation. And we want to carry that conversation through two days. I'll be here for two days, uh, and, and I hope you will as well. And I hope that this is a, a way for us to launch into a discussion. So we need to talk, and we'll try to make some time to do that. Um, those of you who know what this slide is should probably retire at this point, and, uh, because it's clear that you come from an age of 4x3 NTSC uh, 30 frames a second. Um, I'm going to begin by making a couple of comments, but the, most of the talk really flows around this basic idea from one of my colleagues and companions of the past 30 years, David Woods. And the point that he makes here is that as the complexity of a system grows, the accuracy of any agent's model of that system necessarily decreases. Now, agent here is used advisedly. Agent could be a human being or it could be a machine agent. Um, you, we don't make a distinction between those two in most of our discussion. But for purposes of today, we're talking mostly about you and myself as agents. Um, and the bottom line here is that as systemic complexity increases, our ability to have an accurate model, a complete and accurate model of the, of the system decreases. And that's a pretty obvious sort of thing that I don't think anybody will find terribly challenging. However, the consequences of that idea are in fact fairly profound and quite difficult for us and they create, I think, one of the primary motivations for having a community like DevOps. Now, there are some other things that I want to point out. Uh, the first is that much of what we're interested in, the reason you are here today, the reason that we're concerned with these topics is related to learning. With learning is a human characteristic. People are learning all the time. As a matter of fact, most people don't recognize that. People are learning all the time. The problem is they're generally not learning what you want them to learn. Uh, any of you who have small children will recognize this. Um, one of the observations that comes from the meetings that we've done and the work that we're, I'm going to discuss is that learning gets truncated at organizational boundaries. And this is a really important point, and it's one of the reasons why DevOps has made an impact and why it's also limited in its impact. And one of the ways that we'll explore this comes from this. Um, many of you know of a, a, law, a law called Conroy's Law. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, Conroy's Law is... Um, is a statement of a more general sort of idea, kind of broad theme, theme of the relationship between organizational structures and other things. But, but a corollary to Conroy's law, which, which I just made up, is that after accident inquiries model the organizational factors that produce the event. And I've, I do accident investigation in a variety of different fields. I've done it in, in all sorts of different domains outside of IT. And I will tell you that I, in general, can figure out why the accident happened by watching how the accident is examined and dealt with afterwards. In fact, the factors that created the accident are recapitulated in the post-accident reconstruction and the way the organization responds. Something for you to think about when you have your next big outage. Uh, and the, the final uh, bit of this uh, is what I call the curse of DevOps. You didn't realize that there was DevOps came with some downsides, but it does. The curse of DevOps is that continuous deployment requires continuous scrutiny. That is, if you go to this notion of we are going to constantly be poised to deploy, what that means is that you've also bought into a, an idea of being constantly 
looking at the system, scrutinizing it, paying attention to it, being involved with it 24-7 as long as it's up. And you're going to have to organize yourself around maintaining that scrutiny. Most people, when they start to embrace DevOps, imagine that they are going to get this wonderful thing that is going to give them power and purchase and capacity and ability and strength and, and, and good looks and better hair and all that sort of stuff. And what they get is, is in fact something that comes with a pretty big burden. And that burden is the requirement that if you start to adopt this perspective of being poised to deploy all the time, that you are now also responsible for keeping track of what's going on all the time. You have to have continuous attention. And so, you know, you've got CD and CI and all the rest of that stuff. Well, there's also CS, which is continuous scrutiny, and CA, which is continuous attention. Where does this come from? Where do these thinkings and so forth come from? Uh, my colleagues and I, and I'm presenting work from other people, my, the people with whom I've worked. I'm not, this is not stuff that I've done myself. I'm, I'm trying to channel it into this world, if you will. Um, my colleagues and I, over the past roughly 30 years, have been studying systems, how they fail, what kinds of problems occur in them, and so forth. We've done this in a variety of different places. We've done it in operating rooms. We've done it in cockpits. We've done it in nuclear power plants. We've done it in in military settings, we've done it uh, uh, in distribution, transportation, a variety, uh, just a whole host of different places, including now uh, business-facing IT systems, which most of you are involved with. Um, business, businesses that serve uh, their business by the internet, through the internet, which now includes virtually everyone, and uh, I think you know every big company is doing that, are um, a, a rich target area for us and uh, the accident rate is actually quite high. The research that we've done has involved things like looking at medical responses to catastrophes like bus bombings, uh, work in um, disaster situations like following earthquakes, uh, stuff related to uh, space mission operations or to fabrications of semiconductors, uh, nuclear power, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, the point here is that your world is not unique. The kinds of problems that you face are not unique. There are sources of information about how you could cope with those things what likely to happen that are available from other domains. They are not directly importable. You have to kind of go through a kind of meta filter and, and a process of abstraction to get those, and that's what I'm talking about today. Okay? Pretty straightforward. There's been a lot of talk about resilience. Resilience is now a buzzword. It's a little bit like um, uh, lean or something like that. Everybody does it, and so it loses most of its meaning. There are lots of words like this, accountability, transparency, all those things. Whenever you hear one of those key words, you must immediately say, who is speaking? What is that person's angle? What do they think that is? Because, in fact, the widespread use of these words has diminished their value in many ways. And so it, it behooves you, when you hear those words, to say, what is he talking about? Or in Italian, it's like this. That's the Italian symbol for what is he talking about? There are, f there are at least four different ways in which the term resilience is used. Dave Woods has written a paper on these four different ways. If you send me an email, I'll send, send you the paper. But uh, basically, re resilience gets used in conflicting and, and incomplete ways. The first way is, is a sense of rebound, that is, to get back to normal operations as quick as possible after some sort of insult or event. The second is a kind of notion of robustness, which is the ability to survive an event, to, to come back after something has happened without being destroyed by it. The third is a, uh, something about handling new challenges or new kinds of challenges that is usually what we mean, the term we use for this is graceful extensibility, the opposite of which might be brittleness. And then the fourth term is, is sustained adaptability, which is the most I think the most expressive term, Woods will tell you that he's talking about networks of adaptive uh, units of behavior and so on, and if you get into this stuff, it gets really hairy really fast. But, but the idea here is that what resilience is, is the ability to sustain your adaptive posture so that as new kinds of events occur, either challenges or opportunities, you can adapt to those things 
And it's not doing it once, but it's maintaining that adaptive posture so that as the world changes, you're able to keep up with those kinds of changes. The interesting thing about this is that it's a very advanced definition. It's quite subtle. Uh, it also doesn't make a distinction intrinsically between challenges and opportunities. They're both opposite sides of the same coin. That is, the changing world is going to present you with a variety of things that will sometimes look like uh, disasters or catastrophes or threats and sometimes look like opportunities and, and chances to move forward. And, and strictly speaking, resilience doesn't care about the distinction between those two. It's not hard, a hard thing to get your mind around, perhaps, but you can look at the paper and see some more about it. I'm going to use that fourth sense of resilience, the idea of sustained adaptability or sustained adaptive capacity as the notion. When I say resilience, what I'm talking about is sustained adaptive capacity. Now, about eight or nine years ago, a guy named John Allspaw, who some of you will know, a little person, looks like he's about 19, um, said to me, you know, he'd read some of the stuff that I'd written, and he said, would you write a chapter for a book I'm writing on web operations? And I said, I'm always happy to write a chapter for a book. I'm an academic, that's what I do. And I did, and so began what uh, has turned out to be a long and very fruitful friendship between John and, and our group. And that's extended out to a variety of other people, and as we've done this, we've recognized that the DevOps community is largely composed of people who uh, fit a model of a, a kind of activity we would call snafu catching. And so we started a group of about uh, 18, 24 months ago called the Snafu Catchers Organization. It's a consortium. And our job in that is to understand what snafu catching is like, how it's done, who does it, how, what is required, and so forth. I'm going to give you a little history about this. The term snafu, uh, some of you will recognize as a term from uh, the Second World War or perhaps just before. It's a term that came out of the military. It is a, a part of the parlance of working military people, which is that snafu means situation normal all fouled up. Anybody have a military background? Yes, does that name ring a bell? Yes. And you also know FUBAR, which I will not go into it all. Uh, FUBAR is, is, a di is, a, is an extreme version of SNAFU, but, but we'll, we'll skip that. But to stick with SNAFU for a moment, situation normal all fouled up, or if depending upon the kind of language you use, you would use something different. But it's a, it's a very well uh, understood term, which is that the normal condition is that things aren't working. Right? The, the, think about the implication of this. The situation is normal because it is all fouled up. The all fouled up condition is not the abnormal situation. The all fouled up condition is the way things always are. So when somebody would say, how are things going? You could say, oh, it's snafu. And by doing that, what you would be saying is, everything is broken, but it's broken in the ways that are normal for us, and therefore we will get through with this. The, the classic example of this is the Snafu Catchers, it's uh, actually, it was, or Snafu Snatchers, I'm sorry, which is actually a group from um, the um, U.S. Uh, Army Air Force that was involved in rescuing downed airmen uh, during the Second World War in the South Pacific. Uh, and this is a picture of the side of an airplane, which you can go and see. This is down at the uh, U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. If you go there, you can actually see this, and I would encourage you to do that at some point because it's quite, a, uh, quite an emotional experience. And on the side of this, many of the uh, crews would paint a logo of something, you know, it's a, a glamour girl or, you know, of the, the cat or something, some, some sort of cartoon. And the cartoon on this is Snafu Snatchers, and you see this guy here who's kind of smiling and lying in what is a life raft, waiting to be picked up by this airplane. Um, there's, let's, let's be clear about this. This is irony, right? This is not, nobody is imagining that this guy is having a good time just resting out there in, uh, in a raft in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? He's been shot down or, or uh, blown out of the sky, and he's not sitting around, you know, comfortably uh, smiling and having a nice afternoon. So they did turn on the irony for this. There was even a film made 
called Private Snafu, which was a film made in the military during the Second World War, which is about how people screw things up. And it, he was somebody who, wherever he went, so he, there was a character in, in Al Cap's uh, Little Abner called Joe Busflick. Anybody know that? That's too old. Um, but everywhere he went, trouble happened. Now, th the story behind this is actually quite interesting. The, the, when the um, Allied forces were trying the, uh, to make progress in the Pacific campaign, they were going from island to island, called island hopping, in a process of trying to get closer to um, uh, Japan. And each time they would take an island, they would set up an air base, they would start flying missions out of there. But as a consequence, there were thousands of miles of open sea that was essentially the battlefield. And as a consequence of enemy action or mechanical breakdowns or weather or a variety of other things, many planes were lost at sea. And it became so obvious that this was a problem, that this was going to happen, that they built a whole organization around rescuing those uh, airmen, the air crews, who had been dumped into the sea. And there was a specific device made for this called the PBY-5. It's a flying boat. And you can see that it has, a, it has landing gear, but the gear retract into it. And it's got a kind of boat shape so that you can land it on water and take off from water, which was a pretty novel idea at the time. There were pontoon planes, but this was a thing where the whole plane was a pontoon. And the idea behind this was that these boats could be used to, these flying boats could be used to land and pick people up. They were originally designed for long air reconnaissance missions and did form that function, but they were quickly adapted to this. They had big blisters on the side that people could stand in and look out and see the ocean unobstructed, and they had a carrying capacity that allowed them to land, pick people up, and get them out of there. And in fact, that's what they did. This was a very common thing. Here's a site of a, a PBY. You see that they've lifted up the, the a blister uh, uh, plastic on the side. There are people on a life raft getting in here, and you can tell that they're not having a great t deal of fun. You belong to a community that would be politely described as gearheads, okay? Gearhead is a kind of individual. This is a, sounds like a pejorative term, but it, no, it is a pejorative term. Uh, what it means is someone who's interest, instru, interested in the intricacies of machinery and tools and things like that. They are gearheads, fix motorcycles, they build planes, they are very caught up in the technology and the intricacies of things. And gearheads focus on the aircraft. They are PBY fans. You can go on the net, you can find these people. It's, they're focused on the, the capabilities of the aircraft, what it was like, how it was painted, what kind of fuel it tell, took, what kind of range it had, and you'll find a tremendous amount of stuff about that. What you don't see in this, though, is that, in fact, this was a, uh, was in fact an organizational change that required establishment of a whole new service and a whole new way of operations. It required thinking about the placement of these uh, forward bases and the places that could be accessed by the aircraft, supplying crews, putting them in jungle locations, giving them fuel, getting them on missions, sending them out, guiding them to where they were supposed to go, having them do the rescues and come back very often under very undesirable conditions. That organization, that collection of people, the, the skills that were necessary, the insights that were required in order to do that is largely unsung. We don't talk about that. When you go to the Air Force Museum, you'll see the plane, but you will not see the organization that did this. And in fact, the plane was simply a, a, an artifact that allowed this stuff to happen. One of these planes, not from this particular service, landed after the cruiser, the Indianapolis, was sunk. The Indianapolis carried the first atomic bomb to uh, the atoll where it was loaded onto the plane. And on its way back was sunk by a Japanese submarine. There was no message sent out about the sinking. And so these guys were left in the water for five days without anybody coming to their aid, except that one of these PBYs came, landed, and um, put all the men that they could get onto the wings of the plane and sat there waiting for somebody to come. It was far too heavy to take off, but they used it as a kind of giant life raft. What's significant about this for me 
is that there's a combination of things that are involved in making the snafu snatching work. It's not just the technology, but it's also building this kind of construct around what it is that we're going to do and how we're going to do it, how we're going to organize that work, how it's going to interdigitate with our other activities, how we're going to make this all happen. And so we call our group the snafu, snafu catchers because in fact, when we started our studies of IT, what we saw was people like you doing this stuff that looks like snafu catching. That is, your job is not to, in some sense, sit back, you know, drink the newspaper, read the coffee, and watch the blinking lights. Although many people in your management believe that that is your job. Your job is, in fact, to take a system which is barely capable of working, and in fact, in many cases, doesn't work very well at all, and by a combination of activities, including uh, tweaking, writing in commands, changing assignments, doing all sorts of other stuff to keep that thing going so that the lifeblood of your company can run through it. And that's effortful, it demands a lot of attention, and it's, it's in fact qualitatively different work than just sort of saying, oh, I'm going to make another piece of software. A group of companies in Ohio State University, where I'm um, a researcher, joined together to make the Snafu Catchers organization. They include IBM, IEX, which is an online, uh, the first big online, um, uh, um, stock exchange company, and Etsy, which is a uh, uh, global uh, e-commerce site, uh, together to try and look at this stuff. And over the past uh, year or so, we've been doing a project called Coping with Complexity, which is trying to understand how people deal with the complexity of the world that they live in. In March of this year, we had a meeting in Brooklyn, um, Called the, which we now call the Stella Meeting, named after the storm Stella, which struck New York at the time. Some of you will remember what this was like. It was pretty, New York was actually shut down. There were several feet of snow uh, that uh, came perfectly on the day that the meeting was to begin. Uh, this is the way it looked outside of the Etsy headquarters where the meeting took place. Etsy itself didn't have very many people there. None of the companies in New York were open. Everything was closed. And we had our meeting there and we had this discussion where we brought every group together and we went through a bunch of PMs that they had done talking about p what they had discovered, what kinds of problems they had, how that all worked. We're writing the report for that now. That report is going to be out sometime next week. We'll give you a reference to it so you can get a hold of it. It's called the Stella Report, obviously. And the Stella Report describes what we found in that meeting, but it's also a summary of the stuff. And I'm going to tell you about some of the stuff that's in the Stella Report. This is a little preview, right? It's, poor, it's uh, ahead of time, so it's embargoed. You can't report it in the news and so on and so forth. Not that anybody would do that. Um, some of the topics and themes that appeared in the, in, the, in the meeting and that are useful for us are above and below the line. We'll talk some more about that in detail. Postmortems, we'll talk some more about that in little detail. Things we're not going to talk today about, but I think are equally important, controlling the costs of coordination, which turns out to be a major theme in your world. How do we manage the need to have multiple people working on a task which is fundamentally not divisible? It's the multiple watchmaker problem. Um, visualizations that are used during anomaly management, how people get a hold of this stuff, the strange loop quality of many of the failures that we have, which is uh, uh, really dogging us quite a bit. Uh, the distinction between blameless and sanctionless uh, in the actions that are taken after actions, um, and technical debt and dark debt. Um, technical debt, and some of you will know that term, I, I suspect it's used fairly frequently, uh, and dark debt is a new term that we've come up with that describes a different kind of debt that is, I think, probably more interesting. We're just going to talk about the first two of these today, and, and the reason I'm doing it this way is because I haven't finished writing the report, so there's still stuff that has to go in there. But, but the real, the, 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 that's the real reason. The, the ostensible reason is because we're trying to launch a discussion that you and I can have and that we can uh, get a platform for discussing this stuff. So here it comes, all right? Here's above the line, below the line. When you think about systems, most often you think about 
a kind of using world out here, and then some sort of way that that using world has of getting access to a collection of some sorts of resources. And the resources include internally sourced code results, things that you've written, externally sourced stuff, your databases, your software as a service, all that stuff, and a delivery technology stack. It might be your colo, it might be AWS, what, but somehow there's a stack of stuff, and that all goes together to make this thing, and that's mo when people talk about the system, is the system up, is the system working? That's usually what they're talking about. Remember, I warned you that terms that get used widely are very often poorly defined and used in many different ways, and that's going to become apparent here as we go through this. Now, surrounding this is a collection of other stuff, and that's the stuff that you use to accomplish the construction and operation of this system. So, you have stuff like code generating tools, right? Your, your IDE, your desktop, whatever you use, Eclipse, whatever, that generates code. You've got a bunch of testing and validation suites. You've got testing tools that use these suites against this code that generates stuff that goes into code repositories. How many people use Git or similar? Most of you, okay. Um, I, by the way, I find Git very confusing. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, it's a feature. But, um, you also have a bunch, you also have some deploy tools which can work with your code repositories to deploy the system out there. And you have, uh, along with that now, organizational or encapsulation tools. How many of you are using Docker or some container type system? Yeah, okay. How many of you use a VM hypervisor of some sort in some setting? Okay, so that's that stuff, right? And, and then you, when the system is running, you also have a bunch of things that you call monitoring tools. You've got Nagios, you've got, you know, and that's hooked up to PagerDuty and all the rest of that stuff. It's all there, right? So that's, the, that's that picture that's not usually considered to be the system, but in this case, I want to expand the definition of system to include that. Because, in fact, that all has to work together. And for many of us who work in this world, this is actually more where we spend more of our time than actually doing things over there. The system is an artifact of doing this other kind of work. Now, you can also go beyond that, and you probably should. There's a bunch of people who are involved in this. It's not all done by one person. It's done by a group of different people. And those people are doing different kinds of tasks. They're doing stuff like getting stuff ready to be part of the running system. Sorry for the technical language. I just call it stuff. Um, adding stuff to the running system. That's that deploy or however we do that stuff. And then there are people who are doing stuff that's kind of around that, the architectural and framing stuff. And then there are people who are actually keeping track of what that system is doing. They're the, the other, they're the other doing the other stuff. And and interestingly enough, they they talk with each other, they use different tools, they sometimes use multiple tools, they cross a variety of different boundaries. So you see it's not just one-to-one -one mapping here, it's this kind of complex sort of thing. Some might call this a network, but don't do that. <laughs> then people start to talk about network language, and it's really bad. But one of the ways that you can help make some sense of this is that all this stuff down here is artifacts. I'm just going to call that artifacts. And then there are representations. And you see I've drawn a line across here, and I'm calling this the line of representation. And these things are supposed to, these gr green things are so, supposed to re represent screens or ways that you have of getting at the system. They're sort of flattened so that you can look at them. But if you imagine these people looking down and seeing the system through these screens. That line of representation is a boundary between the world up there and this collection of artifacts down below. Above that line, are the activities of people, their actions, interactions, speech, gestures, clicks, signals. People are doing, all these people are doing something. There's a lot of activity up here. There's activity down here. There's activity up there as well. And those people aren't just clicking things. It's not just a click farm. It's actually some people doing something substantive. And that means that they have 
for each one of them must have some sort of model in their heads of what it is that they are doing and what the actions that they are taking are going to have, what kind of effects those actions are going to have. So you see I've got a thought bubble for each one of these people and a little kind of picture of the system. And you'll notice, interestingly enough, that individuals have unique models of the system. These are different. The thought bubbles are different. And if you ask why this is going on here, well, it's, this, is, this is what we call cognition. That's what I study. But the, 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 the questions that are here that they're asking is stuff about the system. They're trying to do stuff with the system, and so they're asking questions. They're asking questions like, why is it doing that? Or what needs to change? Or how should this work? Or what's it doing now? Or what is happening? Or what should be happening? And always, what does this mean? They're all looking at the behavior through the line of representation and responding to this by, in an attempt to understand what's actually happening. They're building understandings essentially on the fly. And the reason they're doing this is because even above this, there's this kind of goal level, which is what matters and why what matters matters. And now we have a pretty good model for what's above the line and what's below the line. And this is the model that I want to try and have everybody hold on to for this meeting because we are not very good about distinguishing between when we're talking about above the line and below the line. And indeed, because you are gearheads. I say that with all respect you're much better at talking about below the line than you are above the line. Way, way better. Like orders of magnitude better. I've drawn in another little thought bubble down here, by the way. It's not just you that has an image of what the system does. The using world people have an image of what your system is and what it does, and that doesn't square with any of the things that you see up there. So one of the consequences of the way that the world works is we have all these different models of what it is that we're working with. There's a model for this and a model for that and another model down here, and they're not all the same model. They've be, been created by people from their experiences, from their tests, from their understandings of how things work, and there are all these models. Here comes the big shock. Ready? You never, ever get to see what's below the line of representation. You may not see it. It does not exist in any kind of meaningful way. All that you can see of your system are the representations. Everything below the line is inferred by you. Everything that is below the line comes from a model that you have. There is no system out there. I mean this in a very literal sense. There is nothing behind the line that constitutes the system. Below the line, you have no access to. To get anything about what's going on down there, you have to look through some sort of representation. You have to call up the code, you have to run a test, you have to do an experiment, you have to look at a monitoring report, but all of those things are not the system, they are representations of the system. And because there is no guaranteed view of the system, because this is hidden from you, all you have is what's up in those thought bubbles. And the great difficulty is that those thought bubbles may or may not reflect accurately what's going on in the world. I'm not saying that the system doesn't exist in some sort of notional way. It does. But that doesn't help you at all because you can never take a picture of it. There's no way you can get a snapshot. It is impossible to produce. You cannot capture the state of the system. The system is indeterminate. And the system state is always uncertain, and you never know what's in it. You may think you know. You may believe that you are running Linux kernel 3.4 with this set of packages. You may believe that you have, in fact, 
chef running with these sets of scripts. You can believe all that, and you might even be able to test some of those assumptions, but there is no way that you or any other agent can build a complete model of that system. It's way too complex, and even more than that, it's changing all the time. The consequence of this is profound. And, and the reason it's, it's so difficult is because we really need to understand, if we're going to understand how systems are made resilient, all the things that you are doing above the line to understand how the system is working. So we need to understand what you are doing when you're in observing, inferring, anticipating, planning, when you're troubleshooting, diagnosing, correcting, modifying, reacting, all that stuff. When you are doing those things, what are you doing it with? And you're not doing it with the tools down here, or even the representations. You're doing it with those models. So if we start to look at those models in some detail and try to understand what's going on, what do we find out? We find out what David Wood said, as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any agent's model of that system decreases. You all have impoverished, partial, largely incorrect models of the systems that you are busy working on. I'm sorry. It's true. Don't tell the boss, but it's true, and you know it. So the question that we want to ask is, how do people working in this world improve the accuracy of their models? How do you get to that? And one of the things that we've clearly observed is that you do it largely by understanding what, when failures are telling you that your world model is incorrect. The whole idea of a PM is not to fix the problem. That is a minor, trivial thing. In fact, the problem is almost always fixed by the time the PM begins. The reason it's almost always fixed is because until it's fixed, nobody has time to do the PM. Right? When the system is down, you're working on getting the system up. When the system comes up, then somebody says, you know, maybe we should talk about that. So PM is a post-event thing, and it is a way of trying to capture the learning, the experience, the difference, the delta, between your understanding of the system and how it is actually behaving and what that implies. It, the purpose of PMs, the purpose of postmortem, is interestingly enough not to make a better system. That might be a goal of somebody down the line. The purpose of PM is to get your model of the system better tuned to what is actually running out there that you can't see. And to the extent that that tuning needs to be shared across those different people, the critical thing is that you have to do that collectively in order that your models have some chance of syncing up. You can't simply just say, oh, I'm going to do a PM, and he's going to do a PM, and the other guy's going to do a PM, or this division's going to do a PM, and that division's going to do a PM, because what you're inviting them is the development and maintenance of essentially separate mental models of the system that are not likely to correspond very well. So what you really want to do in the PM is concentrate on this box here and getting those mental models refreshed with information about the way the system has recently behaved so that you can improve the quality of that model. Well, I see we're coming close to the end of our time together. Um, as my psychiatrist friends always say. <laughs> Let me make a couple of observations about PMs. We've studied PMs now, and it's very hard to do because organizations don't open up their PMs to outsiders. So when we do this, we're the only group that has a sort of cross-sectional view of what really goes on. A couple of things. Every group does it differently. There is no consistent, consistently used model for PMs. Every group uses some sort of timeline. The preparation for this varies widely from none at all to weeks worth of work. Participation sometimes includes management, which generally signals that it's a high value event. The time to do it is one to one and a half hours. By the way, after that, there are sidebars, reverberations, and post posts. There is another postmortem. Very often after your postmortem is done, you will find another postmortem that happens with a small group of people who figure out what really happened. 
In recounting the awareness, the post-mortem story has this kind of arc of a story that's very common. It starts out with an awareness event that be brings us to be aware of what's been going on, followed by a period of confusion, followed by an escalating experience where things seem to get worse, followed by a search for underlying causes, followed by an improving understanding with the identification of obstacles and some sort of cascade, followed by despair and struggle. Um, always told this way, I'm just telling you how you all tell it followed by a period of enlightenment and correction. Um, observations. What we hear very often in PMs is this statement, I didn't know it worked that way. Pretty profound if you think about it. If you didn't know that it worked that way and you're building code for that system, then there is a big gap. The systems, the PMs reveal incredible brittleness in the systems that we have. They're, they're un unbelievably brittle. There's a, often in the organization a desire to rush to the actionable stuff, that is, we all know what happened, what should we do about it, which is the death of learning. Uh, these are intensely social events. The gorilla in the room is usually petted and fed and kept in the corner and given, you know, a banana, because to actually talk about the gorilla in the room would be to create a real problem. Um, they do get better with practice, or at least they get smoother. There are three kinds of events. There's the too small event that we don't do a PM on because it was too small. Then there's a too big event. We don't do a PM on that because the legal department says that we can't do anything until after they're done with it. And then there's the one in between, which legal doesn't know about yet and is big enough to pay some attention to. Um, there's a real urgency to forget about all this and to get back to normal. People talk about the learning curve. The learning curve is, in my view, relatively unimportant. The forgetting curve, however, is critical. Uh, there's a decreasing, there's a, evidence of an increasing dependence on others and their stuff as we go through this. Almost everybody's using now advanced services, and as a consequence, there's some problem with trying to understand how that wor works, especially because learning tends to get truncated at the organizational boundaries. Once you cross the organization, the learning boundary of the learning stops. Um, so what is to be done? Our goal here is to look for and understand the adaptive capacity and how it's being sustained. We want to discover how adaptive capacity is used and sometimes misused, how it's sometimes used up or eroded. We want to un ex find a way to accept the complexity in our system and the irreducible uncertainty that exists in the world because that's the starting place. The fact is that you cannot know what the system is and you never will. And we want to begin to engineer these systems so that we build adaptive capacity with them rather than uh, simply adding on code. Now that's a big challenge, something I don't think we're going to solve in this uh, session, but I want to have us begin that discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing your views on it. I also will tell you that the Stella report will be available. Um, we're going to um, bring it to you here in a little while, and uh, you'll be able to see it on the Snafu Catcher's website. Let me add, bring you back to this really pithy and very important idea, which is the one that I hope you leave with, which is as the complexity of the system increases, the accuracy of any agent's model of that system decreases. And since you are all agents, hopefully agents for good change, this applies to you. Thank you very much for your kind attention.